Welcome to Strange Tales. I'm your host, GD. Tonight's tale I like to call The Curse of Evergreen Manor. It began on a dark night. The rain was full. I was with several of my friends, and yes, we had done many dumb things over the years. That all good and bad, depends on how you look at it. <laughs> Regardless, we was talking about scary stories and experiences we've had. How ironic, huh? And we was at my friend Rihanna's house, and there was about 12 of us. I'll leave the other names out. But we was talking about things we've seen and things we've done and things we'd like to do. And we began talking about haunted places. And Rihanna began talking about this place that her aunt used to talk about called Evergreen Manor. I thought, man, that'd be, that sounds pretty cool. That'd be a cool place to go, you know, check out. And, and then nobody wanted to do it. Then started talking them into it. Then we started talking about doing a Ouija board, of course. So we didn't actually go anywhere that night, but... Next thing I know, two weeks had gone by, and of course we've played with the Ouija board and done all this and that, and that's a whole nother story. But, once again, we came back to Rihanna's again to hang out over the weekend. And of course, began with all the same stories and this and that, and once again she brought up, is like, well, there's always Evergreen Manor. If you guys want to go there, I actually know where it's at. I said... You know where that's at? She said, yeah. And I said, well, whether anybody else goes or not, would you take me there? She said, it's it's dark. It's pouring down rain right now. I said, I don't care. I just want to actually see this place. I just want to say I've been there. And she said, would you stay overnight? And I said, I wouldn't actually stay overnight unless I got paid for it. So, uh, yeah, that leads on to a, a few other stories, <laughs> which I'll tell another day, but... Next thing I know, my friends around me started saying, Hey, uh, if you're going to go, I'd go. That's something different to do. We said, All right, you know. So next thing you know, the 12 of us load up. And we was in three cars. It was very dark. It was on the weekend, pouring down rain, of course. And she had this old beat-up old Ford. <laughs> and she said, I was like, Well... How much gas you guys got? And everybody said, well, I don't know, probably enough to get there. It depends on how far it is. But she said, well, I got a full tank. Everybody just jump in the truck. I said, we're not going to all fit in this truck. She said, well, it is a truck. If you could fit inside, fit inside. The rest of you riding back, just take plastic or something to cover your head. So next thing you know, even though I'm the one that talked everybody into going, and she had mentioned this place, I was the one riding in back. <laughs> You know, some others right up front, some others right in back, and I was the only one that didn't have anything to cover with because everything took that. So yeah, it made it a little bit more thrilling. So next thing you know, it took us 45 minutes of driving in the rain and in the dark. Nothing got in our way, nothing stopped us, and we made it all the way there. And this was, I can't tell you exactly where it's at, but it was, at the time it was located outside Huntington, Indiana. And now it's torn down to the ground. You can't even tell it was there. But at that time it was there. But I will tell you, you wouldn't even see it if you didn't know it was there. Because you could barely even see it from the road. And even then, you have to pull over to the side of the road. Plus, you have to actually get out and just kind of stare into the distance. And you could somewhat see a silhouette of this real big building. You know, we're talking like the size of General Motors or something, you know. I mean, it was big, but I never even actually realized it was there. <laughs> so, yeah, so now we are, we're here, we're there, you know, at this so-called Evergreen Manor, which was an old, you know, somewhat makeshift hospital. It wasn't legal, but it's what got people by at the time. When the hospital couldn't contain people that they could control, they'd send them to Evergreen Manor. And this Evergreen Manor was 
of course, ran by a doctor that had lost his license and had several nurses now and had this whole place you know, that he had turned into his own you know, makeshift mental asylum, basically. And there were several rooms. So next thing you know, we're, we parked the truck, got out. Of course, I'm drenched by then, but who cares? We're all walking up there. I didn't even think they were going to do that. And we actually brought four walkie-talkies. You know, because we had done this before, a couple other places. And many more places after this came, of course. But once again, another story. <laughs> anyway, we walk up there. And it took us about 20-something minutes just to get there. Because it was way off in the distance. Way, it was past the woods on the left side. And you go through this field. And finally, and remember, this is in the dark. And it, you know, it was still raining, but a little bit lighter right now. So we finally get there. And it was very strange. Because it's just, okay, we're going to wake up. We're, we're back home, right? You know, type of feeling the whole time. We get there. And there's this... I made it to the door, and the door was fairly easy to find, surprisingly. And the Evergreen Manor sign had fallen down, but you could tell what it was. Um, a lot of the windows were busted out. Like, I mean, a lot. You know, and there wasn't even a whole lot of windows in the first place. None of the rooms had it. You know, it was just on this front part where it, it was probably, probably looked nice at one time. So we get in there, and we're standing in the, the open area as you go in. And there's a window on each side of the of the door. The door was red, like a real dark red, you know, but you didn't have to get through this. There was a chain on the door, but you couldn't get through the door, of course. But like I said, all the windows were busted out, and there's a window, like a six-foot window on each side of the door. So we just kind of walked in, walked in those. It was probably about a foot and a half to squeeze through them, you know. Get in there, and the only light you could see at this place is this opening where we're standing. And the, you know, the light's probably, I don't know, probably 15 to 20 feet wide. So you're in this big building that you didn't even realize was there. And we're there, you know. So, yeah, we're standing there with our flashlights that kind of sucked and it was kind of off and on. You had to shake them once in a while. Four walkie-talkies. And, of course, there's 12 of us and trying to decide who's going to hold on to the walkie-talkies and what we're going to do now. Because everybody's just kind of, I don't know if I want to do this, they want to go back home, I, I want to go back to the car, I'll just wait. You know, but the way I figured it, man, we came all this way, and I finally talked everybody into this. You know, Rihanna had brought this up a couple times already, so I just, you know, I just, that's just how it was, man. I didn't really have nothing to lose, and, just do it or you don't do it type of person. Kind of like now. You know. So next thing I know. I did get a walkie talkie. I did get a flashlight. They gave me the worst flashlight. <laughs> and they said. It's like, well if you want to explore. Then go ahead and explore. and uh, Take a flashlight. Take a walkie talkie. Hopefully it stays in. And I said how far does this reach. They said I don't really don't know. I said it should be all right. So the next thing I know is the best of my idiot friends. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say idiot friends, but uh, self-protective friends <laughs> stayed in the opening area and they was exploring where the desk was. And, you know, and I said, see if there's any files or old newspapers or something, you know, some type of proof that we was here. <clears throat> so I could hear them shuffling around, looking around there. But, man, I'm telling you, they didn't. They stayed in that area. They were just looking in that er that area. And there was a couple rooms off to the left of that, but you couldn't really, I don't know, man. A lot of stuff was broken, falling. You can't get through there. The only way you could get through it once you're inside is down the dark hallway, and you couldn't see nothing. I mean nothing. But you could tell it was very, 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 very dark. And the only thing you can see, like way off in the distance, is the moonlight trying to shine in through I'm guessing a hole in the wall or something at the end, but you really didn't know where it was. <clears throat> but there was a, before you go in, there's this, this old map, and you can make up parts of this map. But we got lucky because on this map, the part that you can actually see is on the right side of this office where I was getting ready to walk. And it shows, it shows all of these rooms, and they have these uh, metal doors that close. 
you know, basically what you would think of an asylum. But there's no exterior windows or anything. So I said, well, you know, I just kind of slowly made my way through there, and you had to keep kicking your feet, because there's all, I mean, there's all types of stuff all over the floor. You can't see nothing, I mean, literally nothing, not even your hand in front of your face. But you could feel it, you know, and it smells, I don't know, it smells pretty funky. So I started walking, and I keep seeing all these rooms. Some of them were, it looked like they were closed, some were open. Um, and I skipped the first couple, because I kept thinking that uh, I may have better luck just finding some type of proof it was there, like the further I go, however far this is. But like I said, this was actually a pretty big place. Not exactly real wide, but real long, very long. You know, because it was all these rooms connected. So I kept walking and I'd get to uh, probably about the fifth or sixth room after making my way through this slowly, you know. And I still hadn't gone on the walkie-talkie, but I still was using my flashlight that I could somewhat see. You know, it was just dim. And I just kind of kept trying to shine it down because you hold it up, you can't see anything with it. It was so dim. But I could somewhat see, you know, I could somewhat see, but... Um, and then I stopped, and I said, hey, you guys still back there? No answer. You guys still back there? Still no answer. And then I uh, I tapped the walkie-talkie on my leg a couple times, and I pulled that trigger, and I said, hey, are you guys still back there? And then uh, there was no response, and finally, somebody came on there, about scared the daylights out of me. <laughs> they said, hey, man, where are you at? I said, I, I'm down the hall. I said, I didn't get as far as you probably think, but I'm about in the fifth or sixth room, real close to that. And they said, did you go in any of the rooms yet? And I said, I'm getting ready to, but I really just want to make sure you guys don't leave me. And somebody's still back there, and I have a way to get home. They said, we're not going to leave, man, but we're not going to do anything. I said, okay. I said, look for something, a newspaper or something. They said, all right, man. And I said, I'm going to uh, turn my radio off here so I can save the batteries. And they said, all right. And then I know something you wouldn't normally do, but that's what I did. <laughs> so, I turned, so I turned it off, kept walking. I decided to go in this room. I couldn't honestly tell you what number it was, but it was odds and evens. The odds were on the right side. The evens were on the left. But I'm guessing, you know, the fifth or sixth room or so. Go in there. Man, it did, you know, it smelled funky as it was, just like mildew, rotten stuff. You go in there, man, it was just, I don't know. I think there was dead animals in there or something. But there was a couple beds. Uh, there was a sheet that was in there that was like gray and brown or something. I honestly don't, I'm assuming that was just dirt or something. I honestly don't know. But it was weird because it was stuck up on the, the ceiling on the on like the top right corner. It just stuck there. <laughs> it was kind of weird. And I was like, what the world? But I kind of walked around there. I didn't see anything. I seen uh, three keys on the floor. I wish now I would have grabbed those. I didn't grab them. Um, so I kept walking. I walked out of the room. There wasn't nothing there. And the whole time you're hearing, uh, I don't know. You hear, I, I don't know if I'd say voices. More like a whispering. It just sounded like a... Uh, I don't know. It just sounded like people trying to like mumble or trying to uh, be quiet, you know, and, like in the wind and like the wind's carrying on their voices or something. That t I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but that's what it sounded like. And you really wasn't sure if that's what you're hearing or if it's not, you know. So I'm like, okay. Um, I didn't want to think the worst because that would make it worse. So I get out of this room. I start walking further. Um, and I'm walking a little bit faster because my flashlight got brighter. I don't know why. I was like, all right, this thing's working. So I moved on. And a few minutes go by, and I'd walk through a couple more rooms. I didn't really see anything. I couldn't find anything. I could barely see as it was. And then uh, my the chain on my wallet, it hit something metal. Of course, there's like I said, there's two beds in every room. You know, some of them were kind of stacked up on the wall, and others were just laying down. Um, and anyway, you know, they were in there, and 
uh, the only th- I did see some pieces of newspaper, stuff like that, some articles, you know, what you'd expect to see in an abandoned house. Uh, so I walked out of there, and I mean, the smell, I'm telling you, the smell's getting worse. Like, the further I go back, the further I go back. I kept thinking, well, I just, I didn't want to leave without something, you know, so I just kept going. Once in a while, you kind of hold your breath, because you're not sure what's going to happen, or... <laughs> You know, somebody's going to jump out, or somebody's going to grab you, or your friends are just going to come out of the blue and, you know, make you piss your pants or something, you know. (laughs) But, you know, none of that really, none of that really happened. But anyways, I get out and I go further down this this corridor, this dark corridor, this hallway of all these rooms. And there for a while, it's like, you know, you're on the edge of your seat just waiting for something, but there's never anything. Um, So anyway... I go further, and it wasn't until I'm like, you know, the last four rooms or so. I mean, like, almost at the end, and I could actually see this moonlight now. And it wasn't even a window. It was a hole. It was actually a hole where the wall had started rotting through. And if I would known that, we probably could have got through it. It was probably a good, you know, four foot height and maybe a couple feet wide at least or something. But, you know, it was all right. I mean, they're in the front, and... I'm clear back here, but I'm letting you know right now, you know, if something happened, I was ready to jump through that wall for my life and run back to the car, (laughs) you know, but anyway, got through there and I go in this other room or no, I'd got to the door, the middle door was shut, but not, you know, locked. None of these are locked. I think that was controlled by the front desk or something. I'm not sure. Of course, no electricity, nothing, nothing like that. Uh, so I open the door. Of course, everything creaks. I'm like, really? That doesn't actually help. <laughs> open the door. And I'm thinking, okay, so the beds are probably around this back part. That's where the rest of them were, whether they're on the ground or stacked. First thing, you know, you got to figure out, okay, where are these beds so I don't fall over them? So anyway, it's still pretty dark. It's I'm even darker when you go in these rooms. I'm reaching my hand out. Kind of mumbling to myself and I said, okay, I'm talking myself, you know, I'm talking myself my way through this and everything, like I'm going to be okay. Get through this, reaching out, trying to grab something. I'm like, where are these beds? Like that. And then I smelled, a, I don't know, it smelled like a, a match or something. Like a really weird, like, I don't know, like matches. I'm like, what the heck? And I thought my friends were trying to sneak up on me, you know, somebody had a cigarette or something. I'm like, what in the world? I said, come on, you guys. I said, you're not going to scare me. I already made all the way through this. Nope. <laughs> Nobody answered. You know, I was kind of smiling, just waiting, you know, and I was just going to swing and whatever touched me or jumped on me, you know. And then no- there was nothing. And then I uh, picked up my flashlight, you know, from that was in my pocket. I didn't have it on. And then I turned it back on. Man, I'm telling you, when I turned it back on, I seen a shadow, but this shadow was something behind me. So then, of course, I dropped the flashlight, turned around, and then I swung my arms around, you know, real fast, both of them. There was nothing there, man. And then I I turned around real quick, and I went to grab that flashlight. I reached down to get it, and I I tripped over something, man. Like, what the? And I tripped, and I hit my head on the the edge of that metal bed. So I found those. That kind of hurt. And I found the flashlight, so I'm hitting this flashlight on my leg, and I'm looking around with it, you know, I'm like, what in the world? I said, who's there? Who's there? I thought, I'm telling you, I thought for sure one of my friends were going to jump out. So they didn't jump out, and, uh, oh, man, <laughs> didn't see anybody there, but I heard my name. Somebody whispered, whispered my name, and I'm just waiting, but still nothing. So I, I made myself grab a hold of that bed, and I got up, and then uh, I remember I, I tripped over something. I said, what in the world did I trip over? And I remembered that smell, and I, I was like, well, I'm going to feel down by my feet. I didn't move yet. I didn't want to feel down by my feet, so maybe I could figure out what I tripped over. And in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, maybe it's a doctor's bag. You know, maybe it's like uh, old clothes or something. It was something solid that wasn't moving. I'm like, that'd be cool to grab a souvenir. So I went down and I grabbed something. And it felt like a, I don't know what it felt. It felt like a bone or something. 
I'm like, what the heck? There's like, there's no way. <laughs> so then I, I looked around again, and I thought I heard my name again, but I'm not sure if that's what I heard with that. Like I said, it's just whispering. And then I felt down by my foot again, and I realized what I was feeling, and I moved my hand, and I, I felt a foot. I, I, I'm telling you, I felt somebody's foot, and then something touched the back of my my neck, you know, like where the hairs on your neck stand up, touch the back of my neck. And I'm telling you right that that's really all I need to know. I left the flashlight there. I, I threw it at whatever, whatever that was. And I realized what I tripped over. And I'm not going to tell you it was a body, but I'm just saying I, I, I felt a leg and then I felt a foot. That's what I felt over. And I didn't want to look at it. I didn't want to find out what it was. So yeah, I got out of there pretty dang fast. And I just kept running down this cord, cord, this hallway. And I don't know how I didn't run into anything. I finally make my way back. Scared the daylights out of all my friends because I didn't have the walkie talkie on. <laughs> you know, and they freaked out and they came back. I didn't even get to say anything. Next thing you know, we're all running through the windows. We get, <laughs> we ran all the way back to the car, all the way back to the truck. And next thing in a ran, I was like flooring it. Nobody got in our way. Nobody stopped us or anything. We made it all the way back to her house. You know, so next thing I know, we're all laughing and talking about it. And they're like, man, what was that? I was like, what'd you do? You know, they th man, they thought I did something. But, you know, that was the last of that night. And then that's the last we ever had any th experience of Evergreen Manor. And next thing I know... Uh, I can never talk anybody to get ever going back out there, and we all kind of went our separate ways, like maybe a year later. Um, and I still haven't seen any of my friends from back then. And I've also, five years ago, found a friend to go out there. We went out there looking for this Evergreen Manor. I am telling you, it is gone. It's just completely flat. It's gone to the ground because nobody had the rights to, to keep this place up, and it was getting vandalized too much. That's what I was told. So yeah, that, my friends, that is the curse of Evergreen Manor. I hope you liked the tale. Thanks for listening. Tune in next time for yet another tale and another experience. Thanks.